We uh, welcome you all uh, back to um, this uh, historic hearing. And uh, we apologize once again for the delay. Um, we have no control over the length of the roll calls as they're conducted on the floor of the House. But uh, we now are in a situation, since those were the last roll calls um, on the House floor, that we can now have an uninterrupted uh, hearing with our brilliant uh, witnesses and uh, and uh, continue to build out this record on uh, how to handle uh, these very important uh, issues that are facing our country. Uh, let me begin by yielding for our first witness to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce one of the witnesses we have on our panel this afternoon, Mayor John Fetterman from Braddock, Pennsylvania. Uh, Braddock's a, a community in Allegheny County, and, and uh, it's Allegheny County's poorest community. Uh, this was once a thriving blue-collar town of 20,000 people uh, and a place where my father spent 30 years of his life working at uh, U.S. Steel. Today, uh, Braddock has a population of 2,800 people. Uh, John Fetterman has uh, been someone who's been working tirelessly in his first term as mayor of Braddock uh, and, and playing a critical role with, with youth employment in Braddock through green jobs. Uh, he's, uh, with the assistance of some foundations, uh, put together urban farming, community gardens. He's been assisting residents in Braddock to cre create vegetable gardens. And uh, he has currently is working on a program where youth will be assisting in the installation of the first green roof in the Mon Valley. Uh, he is someone who thinks outside the box and, and is, is trying to revitalize a, uh, a community that's struggling and, and uh, is, is hopeful that what we do today with this legislation uh, will start a, a revolution in towns like Braddock and, and get people building things again. So uh, it's my pleasure to have him here today and my pleasure to introduce him to the committee. Great. And whenever you are ready, Mr. Fetterman, please begin. If you could turn on the microphone, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Burton, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm John Fetterman, and I'm proud to be the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. My testimony this afternoon will be short and straight to the point. I don't pretend to be an expert in economics or energy policy, but I do know what I've seen with my own eyes. The path we are on has failed. In my part of Pennsylvania, we've lost a quarter of a million jobs in the steel industry in the past decades. Once thriving towns like Braddock are facing economic devastation. Communities and families face desperate times. We need change, and we need it now. For decades, we've watched jobs leave America. For decades, we've heard about the dangers of America's addiction to foreign oil. For decades, we've seen real change blocked by those who profit from the status quo. If there is a silver lining to this current economic crisis, and from where I sit, it's awfully difficult to find one, it is that America may now finally be ready to find a new path and to face the tough questions we've ignored for so long. I believe that new path starts with a cap on carbon pollution. By driving massive new private investment into clean energies, in industries, a cap offers us the chance to create jobs. And not just high-tech positions making solar cells or exotic technology, but the kind of blue-collar jobs that could revive a town like Braddock or Akron or Detroit. Jobs making 250 tons of steel or 8,000 parts it takes to make a wind turbine. Jobs making new windows like they do in an old factory in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania, a factory that was shut down and but revived to make those very windows. Or LED lights like ma they make in North Carolina and export to China. Or one of the thousands of other products they will take to build this new energy economy. The government investment in clean energy and recovery in the Recovery Act was a good start, but we will not truly transform this economy until we spur the private sector into action. This nation is full of entrepreneurs, investors, inventors, and steelworkers prepared to jumpstart a true energy revolution. And this will only happen once you pass a cap on carbon pollution. To win the most jobs and the most economic opportunity, we must be a market leader in these new products and technologies. And a cap on carbon in the US will spur our companies to be the early movers in these new markets, supplying solutions at home and selling these solutions across the globe. So I respectfully ask this Congress to please be bold, to overhaul our economy and free us from our addiction to imported oil. I ask you to ignore the scare tactics of the well-funded interest and to answer a call of Braddock to build a new energy future 
and a new American century with the ready hands of America's workers. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Fetterman, very much. Our next uh, witness is uh, uh, Paul Sissio. He's the president of the Industrial Energy Consumers of uh, America, a trade association of manufacturing sector companies. Uh, could you push over just a little bit, Mr. Knobloch? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sissio, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking and Member Upton. Members of the committee, the Industrial Energy Consumers of America is the only trade association in the United States whose members are exclusively from the manufacturing sector, energy intensive, and cross sector. Our companies employ over 850,000 employees nationwide. Manufacturing is the only sector of the economy that has a long history of significant investment in energy efficiency. Our greenhouse gas emissions are only 2.6 percent above 1990 levels, while other sector emissions are up about 30 percent. We provide the majority of co-generated electricity for the country, which is over 100 percent more energy efficient than electric utility production. We are leaders, national leaders, in the use of recycled steel, aluminum, glass, and paper, which is also extraordinarily energy efficient. Our products provide the building blocks necessary to grow the economy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions when our customers use our products. We are a model for doing the right thing for business and the environment. Unfortunately, we do not see provisions in the bill that either reward us for our past energy efficiency actions, use of combined heat and power, or recycling, or encourage us to do more. This is a shortcoming of the bill. We have several key points. Number one, legislative provisions that are designed to preserve domestic competitiveness of the industrial sector and prevent jobs from moving overseas will create in our, in our concern about retaliatory trade actions. Neither Congress nor the EPA can effectively regulate our offshore competitors through their actions. Number two, we should not impose unilaterally on U.S. manufacturing costs. A global agreement that addresses the industrial sector uniformly and in the context of fair trade and increasing productivity is the only way to avoid job losses. Number three, U.S. demand for our products will continue. It is just a question of whether they will be supplied domestically or imported. We compete in a global marketplace where pennies on the dollar can determine whether we win or lose with international competition. Unfortunately, as Mayor Fetterman said, from 2000 to 2008, imports are up 29 percent and manufacturing employment fell 22 percent a loss of 3.8 million jobs. These numbers would indicate that we are losing that competitiveness battle. Number four, the provisions entitled Preserving Domestic Competitiveness provides for 85 percent of average needed allowances. Without 100 percent allowances and without reimbursement for higher natural gas and electricity costs, we will lose competitiveness relative competitiveness. Number five, increasing our greenhouse gas costs before comparable costs are placed on our competitors, our global competitors, will put competitiveness at risk. Countries like China and India have said they will not jeopardize their competitiveness and neither should we. Congress must understand that when manufacturers from developing countries engage in international trade, they no longer have developing country excuses for not meeting comparable greenhouse gas reduction requirements and costs. Many of them are world-class competitors using the latest technology and they are owned by their governments and often they are subsidized. Number six, reducing our nation's greenhouse gas emissions from about seven billion tons to five billion tons in a relatively short time period without a, and a readily available abundant supply of low-cost carbon 
that is affordable will drive up energy prices. Energy efficiency and renewable energy will help, but it will not close the gap. Carbon capture sequestration and nuclear will not be contributors over the next 10 years, which means the power sector will be dependent upon natural gas for power generation. Expansion of renewable energy means electric utility companies will be required to build natural gas-fired backup plants. It is extremely important to note that natural gas-fired power generation sets the marginal price for electricity. The implications are significant. As demand for natural gas goes up, prices go up, and electricity across the country. A double hit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cecil, uh, very much. You'll have opportunities in the question and answer period to expand upon your thoughts. Our uh, next uh, witness is Mr. Uh, Kevin Knobloch. Uh, he is the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, he has more than 30 years of legislative and advocacy experience uh, and has served as the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists since 2003. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Knobloch. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Upton, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists. UCS is a national science-based nonprofit organization that's been working for a healthy environment and a safer world for 40 years. I applaud the leadership of this committee for moving this issue forward at this critical time. Today, I am pleased to share the results of a major study we've conducted over the last two years to examine the energy and economic implications of a comprehensive suite of energy, transportation, and climate policies that we call the Climate 2030 Blueprint. This comprehensive approach is similar to the one proposed by Chairman Waxman and Subcommittee Chairman Markey in their draft legislation. We used a modified version of the U.S. Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System for our analysis. Our results show that we can build a comprehensive and competitive 21st century clean energy economy that saves consumers and businesses money and gives our children a future without huge damaging costs of unchecked climate change. And this future is well within our technological and financial abilities. To highlight just a few of our major findings, our analysis found that by 2030, one, under the blueprint, our nation meets a carbon cap of 26 below, 20, 26 percent below 2005 levels by 2020 and 56 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. The electricity sector contributes more than half of the emission cuts in 2030. The transportation sector contributes the second largest area of emissions reductions. The blueprint policies will also cut mercury, acid rain, smog, and soot pollution improving air and water quality and saving lives. Two, we can achieve these deep reductions in carbon emissions while saving American consumers and businesses $465 billion annually in 2030, while maintaining about the same rate of economic growth as the reference case. The blueprint builds $1.6 trillion in cumulative net savings between 2010 and 2030. Families will see an average household savings of $900 a year in 2030, while businesses will altogether save nearly $130 billion a year in the year 2030. Households and businesses in every region of the nation, even coal-dependent states and regions, will see lower energy bills. And third, we can cut the use of oil and petroleum products by 6 million barrels a day in 2030, as much oil as we currently import from the OPEC nations. We did not find that all of these benefits will come for free, but we found cost savings from reductions in energy use due to efficiency will more than offset the modest increase in energy prices and upfront investment costs. The key to this success is the comprehensive policy approach we modeled. The transportation policies get us cleaner cars, cleaner fuels, and better transportation options. The energy policies get us more efficient appliances, buildings, and industry, renewable energy, and more efficient uh, natural gas generation. A transparent and smartly designed cap-and-trade policy assures the emissions reductions the U.S. needs to help avoid the worst effects of global warming. 
This comprehensive approach is so critical that when we stripped out the sector-specific energy and transportation policies in our analysis, the cumulative savings for households and businesses in 2030 were reduced dramatically from $1.6 trillion to $600 billion. We have an historic opportunity to reinvent our economy, to make it more resilient and efficient, and to produce a bow wave of new high-quality jobs, especially in regions that have strong manufacturing capacity, a seasoned, able labor force, and needed resources and infrastructure. In this new homegrown economy, we need people to build wind turbines, build carbon capture and storage infrastructure, weatherize and retrofit homes, install solar panels, and manufacture advanced cars and fuels, as well as to design, transport, maintain, repair, market, and sell all of the above. In my travels around the country, I hear a growing call for a new clean energy economy that is designed to also solve large, stubborn problems by reducing our dependence on oil, making us less vulnerable to blackouts, creating jobs, tackling climate change, and improving our families' health. We know that if we continue down a path of no action, our risks and vulnerabilities will increase, leading to significantly higher costs than if we act boldly today. The uh, Waxman-Markey legislation is a strong start onto this path and onto this uh, clean energy future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knobloch, very much. Our next uh, witness is Dr. Stephen Hayward, uh, who is the F.K. Weyerhaeuser Fellow in Law and Economics at the American Enterprise Institute and a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute. We welcome you, Dr. Haywood. Right, thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Upton. Um, you know, I don't relish being in the role of a naysayer, uh, partly because it goes against my own optimistic nature, and I tend to be something of a techno-optimist. I, I have a lot of excitement about things I see going on in the areas of energy research and development. Can you move the microphone just a Sorry. little bit closer? Yep. Yes. That's usually not a problem in my voice. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm an optimist about a great many things. However, I, I do find myself troubled by an awful lot of, of what I think is sort of wishful thinking and too much, I'll just put it casually, happy talk about the matter. I mean, the last panel I kept hearing that there's nothing but win-win situations out there in the world. Uh, and it seems to me that we seem to feel that we can repeal the laws of economics and the laws of physics at the same time. It may be quite true that for certain industries and certain companies, uh, you do quite well if you give them allowances to emit carbon for free. Uh, but it does seem to remind me of that uh, remark of Charlie Wilson from the Eisenhower era, that uh, uh, to paraphrase his remark, it's not clear that what's good for GE is good for America. Uh, well, I, I prepared uh, my analysis today in this sort of confusing schedule, more tailored for the next panel about green jobs, but a couple of general comments. Um, it seems to me the difficulty here is that, on the one hand, we want to make carbon more expensive, but on the other hand, we don't want anyone to pay higher costs for it. Um, to the extent that we have lots of rebates and give away free allowances, it will mitigate the reductions you're likely to get from it. It would be, to use a simple analogy, as if we decided to try and reduce cigarette smoking by raising the tax on cigarettes, but then rebated the tax back to smokers at the end of the month. I don't think that would be very effective or would certainly reduce its effectiveness. A um, couple of observations here. Um, it seems to me there are three questions to answer or to ponder more deeply. One is, is would a green jobs policy or, or narrow RPS mandates, I say narrow because um, for example, the U.S. Conference of Mayors report on green jobs includes jobs in the nuclear industry as green jobs, yet the nuclear industry is conspicuously excluded from non-carbon sources contemplated in the draft discussion. But will a green jobs policy and uh, renewable mandates uh, result in net employment gains and net economic growth in the absence of, of such policy? Of course it's true in the ordinary sense that when the federal government spends more resources either directly through appropriations or indirectly through tax breaks and subsidies and mandates, you will generate employment where little or none existed before, just as our very large spending over the decades for defense spending generated a lot of employment where it didn't exist before. But I would think the example of defense spending is one we'd want to ponder a little bit. It's precisely the reason we don't see defense spending as a route to permanent prosperity, it's because it does not necessarily add productive and self-sustaining capacity to the private economy. Uh, there's a lot of academic literature, I've made some reference to it in the statement I've submitted to the committee and I won't repeat it all here, a lot of academic literature uh, calling into questions a lot of the analysis and assumptions of the green jobs ideas. 
Um, I think I'll just skip over that in the interest of time and getting to your questions and say that um, I think, uh, summary statement, in the fullness of time, uh, we are going to look back on this period, say 20 or 30 years from now, uh, as the climate policy equivalent of wage and price controls to fight inflation back in the 1970s. Or maybe to pick a, an example that's a little closer to home, the Graham-Rudman approach to cutting the deficit in the late 1980s. And we're going to decide on some fundamentally different approaches uh, to tackling this problem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Haywood, very much. Our next witness is Dr. David Kritzer, who is the Senior Policy Analyst in Energy Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis. He uh, previously taught economics at James Madison University, where he served as the Director of the International Business Program. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll read the disclaimer first at the risk of being redundant. My name is David Kreutzer. I am the Senior Policy Analyst in Energy Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own. It should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee for this opportunity to address you concerning the economic impacts of cap-and-trade policies. Cap-and-trade is a tax. It artificially restricts access to fossil fuels that provide 85 percent of our nation's energy. This restriction drives up energy costs, drives down income, and drives jobs away. Today I will discuss several of the most critical economic impacts. Last year, the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation projected the costs of the Lieberman-Warner Climate Change Bill. The emissions target for the Lieberman-Warner Bill was a 70 percent cut by the year 2050. It should be clearly noted that our analysis could only project for the first 20 years, at which point the carbon reduction scheme is only halfway to this 70 percent reduction goal. The first impact is on national income. Between 2012 and 2030, gross domestic product, the broadest measure of national income, drops by nearly $5 trillion after adjusting for inflation. The second impact is the tax transfer. Coincidentally, it is also $5 trillion. So you have a $5 trillion reduction in the size of the pie, and from that pie you cut another $5 trillion piece to spread around. <clears throat> This money is transferred from energy consumers to the government or those lucky enough to be given the pollution permits, which are also known as allowances. The third and arguably most painful impact is on employment. Employment drops overall, but the energy-intensive manufacturing sector is especially hard hit. By 2030, manufacturing employment loses nearly 3 million jobs because of cap-and-trade's energy restrictions. A map included in the written testimony shows that this impact will be uneven, as manufacturing is relatively more important to the economies of some states than it is to others. Though some of those who lose or never get manufacturing jobs will find employment in the service sector, overall unemployment rises by over 800,000 in some years due to the effects of cap and trade. Another point to note is that these job losses are net of any green jobs created by CO2 restrictions. In the written testimony is a copy of a page from the May 1945 issue of Mechanics Illustrated. It shows what we would call a green job in post-war Paris, a cyclist powering an electric generator. This was an imaginative solution to a lack of coal-generated current done by an ingenious beauty shop operator, perhaps. Today, a human-powered generator could produce about 10 cents of electricity in an eight-hour shift. Now, I don't think anybody's proposing that, but with sufficient subsidies, we could induce people to ride and pedal generators. The problem, of course, is that it moves human labor from producing output worth over $50 per day, and that would be at minimum wage, to producing something worth only 10 cents per day. Yes, we could point to the people riding these bicycle generators and count them as green jobs created, but the overall impact is to reduce economic output by at least $50 per day per person. Energy sources that require subsidies are energy sources that use inputs whose value is greater than the value of the output. Just as subsidizing a cyclist to generate 10 cents of electricity per day will not expand the economy, Forcing energy to flow through uneconomic bottlenecks is not a stimulus. Rather, it will reduce income. In summary, 
We find the first two decades of a 40-year program to cut CO2 by 70 percent will lead to $5 trillion of lost gross domestic product, will increase energy taxes by another $5 trillion, will lead to 3 million lost manufacturing jobs, and 400 to 800,000 fewer over jobs overall, even after accounting for green job creation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chris, very much. Uh, our next uh, uh, witness is Dr. Nathaniel Cohen. Is it Dr. Cohen? Cohan? Cohan, um, Director of Environmental Economic Policy and Analysis for the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Dr. Cohan uh, oversees EDF's analytical work on the economics of climate change and helps develop its policy positions on global warming. Uh, formerly, he was an associate professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. Uh, we welcome you, Doctor. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the distinguished members of the committee for holding this hearing. Um, I'm uh, very honored to be here today. The climate crisis is our responsibility, and it is within our power to address it. We can easily afford strong action. What we cannot afford is more delay. The catastrophic consequences of unchecked climate change may seem remote, but they will happen within the lifetimes of my children and grandchildren. If we fail to address this problem, we must be willing to tell our children we could have addressed this crisis for a little over a dime a day per person, but we chose not to. My message today is simple. The most expensive climate change policy is not having one at all. The economic costs of unchecked climate change are real, and they will be severe. Fortunately, the best available economic analysis shows that the U.S. can easily afford the pollution cuts necessary to solve this problem. In my written testimony, I present results from a range of economic forecasts published last year by government and academia, analyzing earlier proposed legislation. Just yesterday, though, the Environmental Protection Agency released new results that specifically analyze the draft legislation released by this committee. And I'd like to highlight some of those results for you now. First, EPA's new analysis shows that our economy will grow strongly under the proposed bill before you today. Their study estimates that if Congress passes climate legislation this year, U.S. economic output will be 71 percent larger in the year 2030 than it is today. The difference between that amount and what the analysis estimates will happen if we do nothing about climate change amounts to half a percent to a little over one percent of GDP in that year 2030. To put that in perspective, if the economy, if the American economy will reach $23 trillion in January of 2030, if we do nothing to address climate change, it will get there by April or June at the latest with a carbon cap. Now, so far I've been telling you about the cost of climate policy, the estimated cost compared to business as usual. But in reality, the business as usual scenario in these models doesn't exist. It's a fantasy land in which there are no economic costs of unchecked climate change. And we all know that there's no such future. So these models that I'm talking about just look at one side of the ledger, the costs of action, but not the benefits of avoiding, the, the climate, uh, of avoiding climate change and its consequences. So still looking at that one side of the ledger, what are the costs for the average American family? EPA gives us a clear sense of what those are likely to be, and they are small. The average estimated cost to households in the year 2015 is just $14 to $75 per year, uh, sorry, in that year in present value. That's 4 to 21 cents a day uh, over the entire life of the bill. The annual cost is just $98 to $140 per household. That's 27 to 38 cents a day for the average American family, or 11 to 15 cents a day per person. That includes all of the estimated costs of this bill, now uh, of the cap and trade program on carbon. Now, you might say it's just one study, but in truth, this study is completely consistent with everything else we know. As my written testimony describes in detail, the consensus among credible economic analysis is that the American economy will grow robustly while cutting carbon pollution and investing in a clean energy economy. Now, I'm sure we're going to hear lots of numbers in the next few weeks. 
that have been cherry-picked from reports issued by whatever modelers for hire can be found to support the latest or the desired point. Forecasts aren't crystal balls. They are only as good as the assumptions that go into them. And some of the assumptions used to get some of the numbers you may have heard are just simply not credible. The EPA, in its analysis, has set the gold standard in this report by using two of the most credible, transparent, and peer-reviewed models available. And the bottom line from that analysis is that for around 13 cents a day, and I brought 13 cents with me, around 13 cents a day we can solve climate change, help get our economy off foreign oil, and invest in a clean energy economy. As I said in the beginning, the climate crisis is our responsibility, and it is within our power to address it. We can easily afford strong action. What we cannot afford is more delay. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kahn. And our final witness, uh, Myron uh, Ebell, is the Director of the Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He also chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition. Uh, we welcome you to uh, a place that needs that, uh, Dr. Ebell. Uh, thank you for your leadership in that area. Mr. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, for inviting me to testify here today. Uh, before I begin, let me say that I refer to several studies and articles in my uh, very short testimony, and I would like to ask that they be submitted for the record. Without objection? Great. Uh, thank you. So what? Uh, my name is Myron E. Bell, and I am Director of Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I am speaking here today on behalf of CEI. We oppose this bill. We hope it, it will be defeated, and we will do uh, whatever we can within our limited resources to defeat it. Uh, rather than uh, summarize my very brief testimony, I would like to just respond to several things I have heard today. Um, this morning, with the administration witnesses, we heard uh, some astonishing claims in, in very matter-of-fact uh, conversational answers, that this bill will create jobs, that it will reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and that it will help the economy. I believe Dr. Chu and Administrator Jackson uh, said that several times, and I think uh, Secretary LaHood said it at least once. Um, I think that each one of these is wrong, and certainly each one of these claims is, is arguable. Uh, I am not much for modeling. I, don't, I think it depends, as Dr. Cohan said, it depends on what the assumptions are, and you can get almost any answer you want out of a climate model or an economic model. I would rather look at historical experience. We have many of the policies in your draft bill, Chairman Markey, uh, being tried today and have been tried for several years in the European Union and in California. California is falling off an economic cliff. Now, it is not the only reason that they have run up the price of energy so that they have the highest gasoline taxes in the nation. They have a shortage, a continuing shortage of refined gasoline that they have among the highest electric rates in the nation, com comparable with yours in Massachusetts. But it is one of the reasons that their economy is falling off a cliff. They used to have a very substantial energy-intensive manufacturing sector. They used to produce aircraft. They used to produce armaments. They used to produce a lot of automobiles. Uh, they used to have a steel mill and an iron mine. All of that is gone. Now, that has made them less carbon intensive. They don't produce as many emissions, but they still consume all those things. They just buy them from out of state. Somebody has to still produce stuff. So I am very skeptical of these claims. Now, <clears throat> the second panel from the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, and I have some very harsh things to say about the members of the Climate Action Partnership in my testimony, it seems to me that these are guys on the make. They want to get rich off the backs of American consumers, and they want you to enable them to do it. And I would, I would urge you to take a, a step back from the astonishing statement in your, in your uh, executive summary, which the committee put out on this bill, that says that this 
Title III, the cap and trade program, was designed with, uh, to conform to the recommendations of the Climate Action Partnership. And I would also ask to submit for the record, and I'm sorry he's not here, a letter from Chairman Waxman in 2004 to the administrator of the EPA complaining about this very thing when it was revealed that an EPA rule had been written with the cooperation of outside businesses and their lobbyists from a well-known D.C. law firm. Uh, and I think Chairman Waxman was exactly right then, and I would hope that you would, you would think this over again. Now, um, Mr. Rogers said that this will all work if we have a well-designed program. I would like to ask you, in your experience, how many government programs that have been enacted in your time in Congress have been well designed? I would just like you to keep that in mind as you consider this enormous, huge hit on the American economy and, what, and, and, and how easy it will be to design it so that it's well designed. I just can't see it. Now, Mr. Barton asked, uh, and since he isn't here, I will answer his question. Do you favor 100 percent auctioning? Would you still favor this bill? Well, I will still oppose this bill, but I do favor 100 percent auctioning. I think that 100 percent auctioning of the rationing coupons removes a tremendous amount of the opportunity for gaming the system, uh, conning, uh, con games, and corruption. And so I would encourage you all to vote for an amendment that would have 100 percent auctioning. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ebel, very much. You hit the, the number right on the minute.